As more men summon the courage to come forward, at least four police forces are investigating alleged historic abuse of boys by their football coaches. Good evening. What started with one shocking interview in a newspaper has led to more and more men coming forward to claim they too were abused as boys by football coaches. With several police forces investigating, we speak to former England international Paul Stewart about his decision to speak out. Also tonight, the mother of a man who died after being tasered by police tears up the report of the police watchdog as the judges effectively do the same, ordering the IPCC to reinvestigate. Fury in the Philippines as the strongman President Duterte puts on a hero's burial for his predecessor, Ferdinand Marcos, 27 years after his death. And The Daily Show's Trevor Noah on how similar race hatred in America feels to the South Africa of his childhood and living with Trump. What the hell is going on, people? People are, you know, walking around saying Zich Heil again, and people are saying, oh, well, I guess, you know, that's just how some people are. No, it's not how some people are. And that normalization is something that I won't accept. The scale is only just becoming clear. Now the National Inquiry into Child Sex Abuse says it could start looking into allegations by former footballers that they were abused within the sport. Four police forces have now confirmed they're investigating a growing number of reports of historic sex abuse in football clubs. So just how widespread could this scandal be? In our first report tonight, Here's our sports correspondent, Kamian Zerum. Playing professional football, the schoolboy dream. But how many young boys were abused by a scout, a coach or a manager? Two more players spoke out today about what they say they went through decades ago. It was football's awful secret until former Crew Alexandra player Andy Woodward realised he could no longer suffer in silence. It has been rough, but he is standing tall. I've had about three hours sleep in about five days, but I'm determined with this and, and you know, I want to sort of achieve my goals now and, you know, help all these people and then look at long term what I can do to, to assist any sort of the FA, etc. Um, it's been a roller coaster. If I may. Every day, more players um, contact Andy for help. Four of them appeared together on television this morning. Chris Unsworth, like Woodward, says he was abused by Barry Burnell a talent scout and convicted paedophile. Unsworth broke down live on air. Never told anyone. Kept it locked away right in the back of my head. Both my parents have died. And that hurts me. Yeah. Not telling them. The three clubs linked to Barry Burnell and the allegations of abuse are Manchester City, Stoke City and Crew Alexandra. Burnell also worked with youth teams across the Midlands. In another development not connected to Burnell, an unnamed player with Newcastle United has alleged abuse by a former Newcastle coach, George Ormond. Ormond was jailed in 2002 for assaults over a 24-year period. Several police forces are now investigating allegations, including Northumbria, Cheshire, the Met and Hampshire. When Channel 4 dispatches confronted the FA back in 1997 about child sex abuse, Charles Hughes, their head of welfare, walked away. Hello, I'm Deborah Davis from the Dispatches programme. Oh, you're really? We have been in communication. Um, we, Mr Hughes, we wanted to ask you about the FA's attitude to prevention of sexual abuse of children. It is telling that it has taken another 20 years for someone to break the code of silence. Just how guilty is football of covering up the abuse that increasing numbers of brave footballers are now speaking up about? When Barry Burnell was convicted, the Football Association didn't really want to know. The FA have now moved on from here at Lancaster Gate to Wembley. But what has actually changed? Believe it or not, the procedure for clubs to refer on concerns about abuse is still effectively voluntary. Clubs decide for themselves whether to pass on rumours of abuse. 
Hello, you're through to the NSPCC helpline for people who've experienced abuse in football. We're increasingly getting more parents coming forward, for instance, and saying, well, look, my child's playing in football at the moment. They're in a club. Are they actually safe? What should I be saying to them? What should I do to make sure that my child is actually safe at the moment? And we have had a number of people coming through who have been concerned about contemporary issues. The FA says it's written to 30,000 football clubs to raise awareness. At least four police forces are now investigating. What else is still to be revealed? With former players saying the scale of this is bigger than the scandal around Jimmy Savile. Well, as we've heard, police are now carrying out an investigation into the claim by a former Newcastle United player that he was abused in the club's youth system. It's reported to concern ex-coach George Ormond, who was jailed for a series of assaults in 2002. Our reporter Paul McNamara is in Newcastle. Paul. Well, we're here at a shocked St James's Park. And for those of you who aren't familiar with St James's Park, Unlike many football grounds now on industrial estates on the edge of town, this is the city centre. Football is quite literally at the heart of Newcastle. And today they discovered that one of their own, a former professional here, claims that he was abused by a coach or part of the youth system. The abuser, the alleged abuser, is George Ormond, a man who used to be a part-time coach here, a man who in 2002 was convicted of a string of sexual offences covering 24 years and sent, to prison for, and sent to prison for six years. The judge called him a predatory abuser. This afternoon we went out to an address in Sunderland where he lived up until about a year ago. We spoke to a number of neighbours there who claimed they had no idea of his past when he first moved in. But when his criminal convictions were made known, one neighbour told us he was, quote, paid a visit and very promptly moved away. Now today police say that they, there is an ongoing investigation, they are in touch with and supporting the victim. Newcastle tell us that they want nothing more than to help in this investigation, but up until about an hour ago they still hadn't heard from the police. We've also spent the day talking to people involved in grassroots football, people involved in youth football around the city, and they've told us that they are devastated about this. But crucially, while they would tell us that in person, they wouldn't say it on camera because they admitted they did not want to put their heads above the parapet. And that just highlights just how brave these footballers who have come forward so far have been. Paul McNamara. Well, I'm joined firstly by Paul Stewart, a former footballer at clubs such as Liverpool and Spurs and also an England international. Mr Stewart came forward this week detailing his own allegations of the years of abuse he suffered as a young player and the effect it's had on his life. Also with me in the studio is Tom Perry, founder of Mandate Now, a group which says staff should be legally compelled to report any abuse witnessed in regulated activities like football coaching. Paul Stewart, first of all, can you tell me, why did you come forward now and how did you summon that courage? Um, <clears throat> it took a lot of thought, um, really. I read uh, Andy Woodward's story uh, last Friday. Um, it was almost like reading my own life story um, to a certain extent. Um, I felt when I read it that um, Andy would need support through this because um, I didn't want the story to fade away into insignificance um, but I didn't respond straight away uh, I needed to speak to my family uh, my wife my children and my parents because ultimately uh, me coming forward also affects them I needed to be sure that they were completely comfortable with me coming and saying uh, my story uh, before I did anything. Um, so that's why I waited for the weekend um, before I, I spoke to the media on the Monday. What, what is your goal primarily now? Is it to see justice in your own case? Uh, no, not at all. Um, it, it, it's probably far from my goal is, is, is particularly my case. Um, uh, as stated uh, previously, it was to support Andy to, to, to um, keep the story in the news. Um, but moreover, um, because I have played for some big clubs and my country, I wanted people that have suffered this, 
whether they were just at youth level or, or, or even if they didn't make it uh, as a footballer or any sport uh, that, they, uh, that they entered into and anything like this was happening. I wanted them to know that they, they, that they can come forward. Uh, there is no stigma behind, we are the victims here in this, uh, in, in this story. Um, and I do hope that the people that um, committed the offences do get the punishment, but I want to make sure that the people get the help that they deserve that um, um, caused the issues that I've had over the years. I don't want them to feel that they have to go through the pain and suffering that I've been through and that I've put my family through. And ultimately, um, that uh, we try and eradicate uh, this if it's still happening. Uh, as we say, we think it's only the tip of the iceberg, uh, iceberg in the football, but um, to eradicate it in, 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 in all walks of life, uh, I'm, not, I'm not silly to think that you're going to totally do it because these people are very clever people, they're very manipul manipulative, and um, if we get the awareness out there, then they're, they're going to at least think twice before approaching um, sports people because children... Uh, it's a perfect praying ground for them, um, any sport, really. Now, you clearly think this is a very widespread problem and may even still be going on now. Uh, to what extent do you think people in authority must have known this was going on? Do you think this has been buried? Do you think there's been well, any I, sort of cover-up? Um, well, listening to the story about dispatches, um, which I did hear earlier in the week, and the dismissal by uh, Mr Hughes, then we certainly can go back 20 years. It doesn't take um, um, a genius to work out that with all them teams out there, and w when they're going from 11 years of age, and now, uh, when, I, when, when, I, when I started out, it was 11 years of age, now from as young as six and seven, it doesn't take a genius to, to, to work out the mathematician, mathematici of, of what could be happening. Let me just bring in Tom Perry, who's with me here in the studio. Now, we saw in Kemi and Zaren's piece that it is still effectively a voluntary system of reporting. You want that changed? I have. We most certainly do. Um, you know, this is an absurd situation. Um, you know, the fact that uh, it's discretionary whether you report a suspicion, it doesn't support the member of staff that is actually taking on the full responsibility of reporting a suspicion. The first thing they feel that they have to do in reporting a suspicion is gather the evidence. Well, they're not equipped to do that. They're not in a position to do that. They don't have the power to do that. So what we want people to do is simply report and be supported in port reporting because it is mandated to report. Why, why do you think there is resistance to this? Because there is. Uh, there is. There is significant resistance to this, but it has nothing to do with child protection. It has to do with the fact that there were 670,000 referrals to the local authority last year and the government simply doesn't want any more because they're going to have to stump up money. So this is a matter of money. They don't want more referrals arriving at the local authority. That's it in a nutshell. Now, in very simple terms, it has been proven from, from very good research in Australia, particularly Australia, where there is such good data capture. Um, there's a seven-year um, longitudinal study by Professor Ben Matthews. And you get, when you introduce mandatory reporting, you get an increase in referrals from the reporting bodies of between 2 and 3.7%. Uh, sorry, 2, 2 and 3.7 times. And that puts strain on a system which is already under strain at the local authorities. So this is about no more referrals. OK, I, I just want to go back to Paul Stewart for a, for a last word with you, Paul. What, what is your message to people who are watching tonight, who, like you, were, you know, like you read the newspaper article the other day, who may be thinking, uh, maybe I should come forward too? I would urge them to come forward. Um, I think for their own salvation, um, but also to, to, to get the people that um, have maybe buried this, if it has been buried, I, I'm not saying, suggesting for one minute that it has, but these people need um, support. Um, they, need, they need to get on with their lives and know that 
it wasn't their fault. Um, and this is sometimes uh, difficult for them to, to, to handle and that's why they don't come forward. So, but I would urge them to come forward because they're not alone. They're not alone and I'm sure um, there will be support for them um, uh, whatever walk of life they come from. Paul Stewart, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight and Tom Perry, thank you for coming in. Now, children are being put at serious risk of sexual abuse because of errors by Britain's biggest police force, according to a shocking new report. In a review of nearly 400 cases involving children, the HM Inspectorate Constabulary found three quarters were handled inadequately or could have been improved. Examples included an officer not being assigned to a case of sexual abuse of a teenage girl until 17 days after it was reported. Scotland Yard has apologised to the children involved, saying it aimed to provide the best possible protection. Now, pro-Brexit Tories have rounded on Sir John Major for suggesting a second referendum on Britain's departure from the EU would be perfectly credible. The former PM said the Brexit process should not be subjected to the tyranny of the majority, sparking anger amongst Eurosceptics. And in another throwback to 90s politics, Tony Blair has got involved too. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, is in Westminster now. Michael. Well, uh, pro-Brexit uh, leaders today have been reacted angrily to these two former prime ministers. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, no friend of John Major, uh, described his remarks as the absolute dismissal of democracy. Nigel Farage told me tonight that Blair and Major underestimate the degree of public hostility that their remarks are bound to stir up. What's interesting, I think, is Tony Blair's intervention here. He's made it clear in recent weeks that he's hoping to play a bigger role in politics in the years ahead than he has in the decades since he stood down as Prime Minister, but not in frontline politics, uh, but behind the scenes in political discourse. And on this specific issue of whether there could be a second referendum, Mr Blair's view is that this can't be imposed from the top in the same way that, say, the EU forced Ireland to have a second referendum. Mr Blair thinks that there, if there is to be a second referendum, it's got to come from a substantial change in public opinion resulting from detailed scrutiny of the possible Brexit deal. In other words, Mr Blair thinks that you might get a second referendum, not from the top, not from the elite, but from the bottom. Thanks, Michael. Now, senior judges have ordered the independent police watchdog to reinvestigate the police taser death of a factory worker in Manchester. In the first ruling of its kind, the High Court quashed the IPCC's original inquiry into the death of Jordan Begley in 2013, which cleared any officer of blame. Here's our senior Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel. Today's unprecedented ruling may be phrased in legal terms, but ultimately amounts to this. Well, you know, I don't really know what I can do to it now, because finally we might get a proper investigation. An entire because, uh, investigation ripped to shreds and a mother offered another chance to get justice. Her son, Jordan Begley, died in July 2013 after he was tasered inside the family home. At the time, his mother described to me what happened after she had called the police herself when her son rowed with a neighbour. All I was focusing on was Jordan was stood there, the officer was stood here, the taser was shining at Jordan. How can you be sure that his death is somehow connected? To well, being you told me he was alive before they turned up. Right, I made the phone call at 12, 16 minutes past eight. By half past eight, that, that kid was dead. So you told me it wasn't the taser that killed him. An inquest jury's verdict was damning of the events that took place here in this street three and a half years ago. It found Jordan Begley had been inappropriately and unreasonably tasered and restrained. Yet the IPCC found no officer could be blamed for what ultimately led to the 23-year-old's death. Today, Mrs Begley feels she's come full circle after High Court judges ordered the Independent Police Complaints Commission to carry out a new investigation. What does this ruling today mean to you? It means the world to me. It means someone actually believes now that this was flawed. And on Jordan's death certificate, it says the tasering and the restraint of the police contributed to my son's death. Now you tell me why no one's been punished for it. In Jordan's case, the trigger on the taser 
was held down for more than eight seconds, too long the inquest concluded to have been reasonable. And the IPCC ultimately accepted its inquiry had failed to consider officers' conflicting accounts. Until someone says sorry or is punished for killing my son, this case will never be dropped. I will never, ever give up. There is no guarantee a new investigation will come to a different conclusion. Five officers involved declined to comment, but today at least grants hope to a mother grasping for accountability. A serial killer has been sentenced to a whole life term in jail for the murder of four young men. Stephen Port stalked, drugged, raped and then killed his victims. The deaths of the four men bore similarities, but police apparently failed to make the link and have since apologised for missed opportunities. Victims' relatives applauded as Port was told by the judge he should die in prison. Thousands of protesters across the Philippines have taken to the streets after the ex-dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, was buried in a secret military ceremony. Activists have turned their anger on the current president, Duterte, for sanctioning the burial, while his hardline war on drugs is threatening to dent his popularity. As our Asia correspondent, Jonathan Miller, reports, and a warning, there are some distressing images in this report. <laughs> These people believe that when the dictator Ferdinand Marcos was furtively buried a week ago today, justice was buried too. Marcos had spent 25 years on display inside a glass box, and much of the 25 years before that, plundering Philippine national coffers and torturing suspected communists. Now he's entombed in the Heroes Cemetery on the orders of President Rodrigo Duterte. The people no longer had the power to stop it. They chanted Duterte, traitor, lapdog of the dictator. They took me inside a small cold room. They poured water on the floor and made me stand in it. They wrapped naked copper wires around my fingers and my body. They asked me questions and when they didn't like my answers, they electrocuted me. I was screaming. Hero, hindi siya hero. They say he's a hero? He's not a hero. He was dishonorably discharged by the people. The secret burial was proof of the power the Marcos family still wields. They continue to dominate the politics of their home province. Imelda remains in Congress. Ferdinand Jr. ran for vice president this year. President Duterte has repeatedly denied that Marcos' money helped bankroll his campaign to be the president. But these people find it very hard to forgive him for finally allowing this now long-dead dictator to be buried a national hero. And some here worry that their new authoritarian president could be another Marcos in the making. Today, President Duterte addressed Filipino troops, justifying his decision to allow the Marcos burial. In recent weeks, he's even mooted martial law himself, and most recently threatened to do away with habeas corpus. Last month, he said he'd be happy to slaughter three million Philippine drug addicts and peddlers, just as Hitler had exterminated Jews. The law and order candidate, once president, has unleashed a bloodbath in which 5,000 people have been gunned down since July. He's still wildly popular, but the killing spree Duterte has licensed has sparked alarm abroad and fear of what's to come at home. This a service of remembrance for the victims of his war on drugs. The Catholic Church becoming more vocally opposed now to the creeping normalization of the killing. That's what we are afraid of. Hopefully it will not lead to it. That's why we should be speaking. No, uh, that's uh, what the worst that can happen, that people can take it as normal, that it is okay no, just to kill anybody. So that's what we don't want to happen. Duterte's death squads have already killed more people than Marcos ever did. And his final solution for this country's drug addiction problem is causing pause for thought for Filipinos with a sense of history for whom there's resonance and symmetry. 
Now, from impersonations to sketch shows and political cartoons, Donald Trump's election campaign was an absolute gift to American comedians, not least The Daily Show's presenter, Trevor Noah. But 17 days ago, for a moment at least, he stopped laughing when the joke became reality. Thank you so much, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Show. We... Trevor Noah took the reins of The Daily Show as Donald Trump was in the early stages of demagoguery. And, and you, know, you know what else makes the star racist? The fact that you got it from a neo-Nazi white supremacist website. Now the satirists have to wonder whether the joke is on them. The Saturday Night Live team at least have the self-awareness to laugh at themselves. What if there was a place where the unthinkable didn't happen and life could continue for progressive Americans just as before? Now there is. Welcome to the bubble. On The Daily Show, Trump's victory made comedy suddenly uh, difficult, and the host was blunt about his feelings. Uh, this is it, the end of the presidential race, and uh, it feels like the end of the world. Yeah. Trevor Noah comes from as far a place as possible from his predecessor, John Stewart, the Jewish New Yorker who made the show a hit. I've been holding my arms like this since I got here. Noah was born to a black mother and white father in apartheid South Africa. His book is called Born a Crime because he was... But despite being set in a faraway land and a historic time of racial hatred, there are many thoughts it provokes about modern America. Well, I went to meet Trevor Noah earlier, and we began by talking about how his black grandparents treated him differently because of his white dad and light skin in apartheid South Africa. My grandmother spoiled me. My grandfather did the same. Um, I never thought to myself that my grandmother and grandfather were treating me differently because of my race. I thought they were treating me differently just because I was one of their favorite grandchildren. Your grandmother wouldn't beat you? Yeah, my grandmother was petrified. She would not administer any type of, of, of discipline that was physical because she was afraid of my skin. She didn't know how it would react, you know. He always used to say, she's like, I'll, I'll hit the black children, but I don't know what to do with this one. Your grandfather put you in the back of the car? Yes. As well. My grandfather just refused to have me sit in the front seat. He always used to say, Master sits at the back and that was his world. He was driving me, and I happened to be the master in this situation, master slash grandkid. Do you look at race in America differently because of your South African background? Definitely. You know, I see in America a bizarro and yet mirror image of South Africa. So you don't think of America as the land of the free? No, I don't. I mean, up until this year, um, I think it was a beautiful experiment, and it still is, you know. You know, we hope that, that the dream is not doomed. Um, so what, where do you go now as a satirist? Because, I mean, you all got quite serious, didn't you, immediately after the election? It was all sort of quite a big, big intake of breath. Yeah. I don't know how to be funny for a moment. Yeah, because comedy's tragedy plus time. When you're doing a live show on election night, there is no time to absorb the tragedy. So I'm still a human being. I'm still going to react. Because you must remember, I'm having flashbacks and flash forwards to Brexit. Look at how there was a spike in xenophobic attacks. Look at how there was a spike in racism and hate speech. Look at how there was a spike. And I was going, if that can happen in the UK, what's going to happen in America? That was always in the back of my mind. If this guy wins, and I always said it, the message that it sends is one that, you know, ignites the worst in people. And so in that moment when they said Donald Trump is winning, and you go, wow, we are in for one hell of a ride. Did you wonder whether it was fake news? <laughs> for a second, I thought it was a sketch. I still don't... It still feels like it's just, like, some big show that we're watching. It doesn't feel real. But it is real, isn't it? And, and, and I wonder to what extent you feel you've got to use your platform to reassert facts. Now my goal is to try and expand people's bubbles. Because Donald Trump as a leader is someone I'm familiar with coming from a third world country. I'm familiar with that type of leader, someone who comes along and promises everything, someone who has conflicts of interest in the world of business. So if anything now, in terms of reasserting facts, one thing I've learned, you can't force anybody to accept a fact. Facts have now become opinions. Except facts aren't opinions, are they? I mean, there, there is such a thing as a fact. We think so, <laughs> we hope so, but we don't know anymore. You know, it, it, it feels like we're getting to the place where facts are opinion. You know, you're seeing on the news where every opinion is entertained as a fact. I mean, just recently, CNN, I'll never forget, had a lower third that said, you know, white nationalists ask, are Jews people? And I was like, how on earth are we even... This is now a question? 
Do you think Trump is being normalized as a president now? Already you're seeing that. Already you're, you're seeing people saying, oh, well, I mean, you know, as a president, we've got to give him a chance. And I go, but he's already giving you answers. He's already... When you, when you appoint Jeff Sessions, a man who has a record of actively opposing civil rights, is that not you blowing the chance? When you appoint to the White House as one of your chief advisors, a man who runs a website that is a known hub for neo-Nazis and white supremacists, is that not blowing your chance? At what point do we say that the chance is blown? People will try and normalize it. People already try to normalize it with... They talk about neo-Nazis like it's just like a, a way of thinking. They talk about it like it's hipsters. All these young... Who are these young, hip, white nationalists that are... What the hell is going on, people? People are, you know, walking around saying Zich Heil again? And people are saying, oh, well, I guess, you know, that's just how some people are. No, it's not how some people are. And that normalization is something that I won't accept. And, you know, I I will constantly push back against because it's very dangerous to slip into it. It's like a tug of war. It never happens all at once. It's inch by inch by inch. And then one day, one side pulls the rope and then all of a sudden you're going, how did we get into this situation? Trevor Noah, stay with us on Channel 4 for Unreported World, following straight on after the weather.